The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm Tammy Grimes. They keep doing it, and for the most part, they're apprehended. Why, then, do they do it? Since when they're caught, it means either the chair or a life sentence. I'm talking about murder. Hate, jealousy, fear, revenge, money, and variations on those themes are the most popular motives. A gamble, really, in which the slayer values life, including his own, too cheaply. But today, it is not a tale of why or how murder was committed, but how the law and fate closed in on the killer. Andy, why did you attempt to leave town? Because Cornelius told me to. What did he say to you? He said, the heat's on, Andy. You better move on. And I said, where'll I go? And he said, here's 500 bucks. Go as far as you can. And I said, why? He said, there's been a death in the family. And you don't want to know anything about it. Our drama, The Imperfect Crime, was written especially for the Mystery Theatre by James Agat Jr. and stars Russell Horton. I shall return shortly with Act One. It could be any medium-sized town with the Hoosgau houses, more drunks than desperados. So Chief of Detectives Charlie Allen was not expecting that phone call from Officer Kowalski at the end of his 1 a.m. shift, reporting what appeared to be the result of a hit-and-run accident. Oh, what do you mean, appears to be, Kowalski? I, uh, did you find the deceased in a bar, in bed, or, or in the middle of a street? On the corner of 22nd and J.T., the victim is a female, about 50 years old, but she's dressed funny. Kowalski, would you mind clarifying that statement, she's dressed funny? Well, she ain't dressed for going out in the street. She's got pajamas on. That's all? No, a robe over that, but no shoes. Like, she got up out of bed and walked out of the house. Yeah. Any other IDs? Well, I don't see any pocketbook, but I'll take a good look when the boys get her over to the morgue. I'll ride with him. No, 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 you won't. You call Bob Brody, the photographer, and get him over there before you remove the body. I want pictures from every angle. Yes, Chief. Uh, you got anyone with you? Uh, Officer Parisi, sir. Okay, uh, you get him to knock on all the doors of nearby houses, ask who heard anything or saw anything at, at what time. I'd like to do that, Chief, but 22nd and J is a square mile of nothing. That's where they were going to build the housing development. Only rats and cockroaches live here. Yeah, no nearest house. No, not one. And even if there was, the streetlights are all out. That's probably how the female got hit. Uh, 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 Kowalski, uh, come in and see me before you go off duty. It could be morning. You going to be there, too? If I ever heard of a case that requires overtime, this is it. You bet I'll be here. Oh. Police headquarters, Charlie Allen speaking. Charles, I've been trying to get you for hours. Your line is always busy. Is that you, Matilda? Well, certainly it's me. Are you coming home for a late dinner? I've kept it warm for you for hours. I won't get to bed. Well, I can't. There's a case that's breaking. Charles Allen, you're impossible. Yes, darling. It better be a matter of life and death. That's all I can say. Nah, it ain't life. Kowalski just called in to report a hit-and-run victim. We have to get on that trail before it gets cold. Oh, dear me. A, a car accident? Yeah, it sounds like an accident, but my Sherlock bones tell me it could be murder. <laughs> Charles and his Sherlock Bones. That's what he always calls his hunches, feeling it in his Sherlock Bones. If I wasn't so sure he loved me, I'd be a little suspicious all those times he stays late. Oh, I know, I wasn't the first woman he loved, but I am the only one he married. 
Cornelius, I didn't mean to get you up so early, but I need your help. Uh, Charlie, six o'clock is a wee small hour, but you know me. Once a public defender, always at the service of the public. Just because I'm retired doesn't mean I wouldn't get up at the crack of dawn to help our men in blue. You don't have to give me all that, Cornelius. I was only apologizing for the inconvenience. Now, uh, um, you see this ring? Huh? And it put on your glasses so you can see the inscription. It says, from Charlie to Jesse. Now, this was a gift from a high school senior to a high school junior about 30 years ago. Isn't that nice? This ring was the only ID on a hit-and-run victim picked up last night at 22nd and J. I'm following you, Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I'm the Charlie. And I gave this ring to Jesse Habermeyer 30 years ago. We were in school together. Ooh, I was crazy about her. <laughs> And then I went off to college, and when I came home, Jesse had married Winfield Scott. And, yeah, uh, the Scots owned this town. They had all the money. So I couldn't really blame Jesse. Jesse Scott, a hit-and-run victim. <gasps> Good Lord. After Winfield passed away, she went on wearing my ring. Mm. Nice sort of thing between old friends, but that's all there was. Just this ring. Look... I'm asking you as a favor, because I can't do it. Uh, would you go down to the morgue and, and make a positive identification? I, 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 I can't be the one. No, oh, of course I will. I don't quite understand how awful it would be for you. I sincerely hope she isn't her. Doreen Cornelius. And Kowalski described the woman who sure could be, Jesse. And she could have lost the ring. Somebody else picked it up. Gave it to this poor woman. Who knows? I'll go over. Of course I will. Maybe it's not Jesse. Don't give up hope. The uh, victim, you say, whoever she turns out to be, was hit by a car? Yeah, that's all we know now. Uh, I better get going. It's certainly an unhappy day for me if it turns out to be Jessie. She was one of those marvelous people you thought would go on forever. Yeah. That's the way I remember her, too. I'm really going to miss Jessie. We all are. If it's her, let's pray it isn't. Charles didn't come home at all that night. He called me in the morning with the sad news that the hit-and-run victim was Jesse Scott. It had been confirmed by Cornelius Spry. I didn't know what to say to Charles, because since we were children, Jesse was the one love of his life. When are you coming home, I asked him. What did you say, Matilda? I said, when are you coming home? Where are you? Uh, I'm in a squad car, Matilda. Uh, Kowalski's driving me to where they uh, picked her up, but... I mean, you know. Of course I know. It must be very difficult for you. Yeah, I I'll be talking to you. Bye. I could have brought the tire molages over to you, Chief. Uh, it's okay. I, uh, I wanted to see where it happened for myself. Oh, and I want to thank Jack for working overtime to make them right. And you've been putting in some long hours on this, too, Kowalski. It's funny how some cases keep you up right around the clock and you don't even feel it. I guess it's because I knew she was a good friend of yours. You realize this is a promotion for you, Kowalski? No, I didn't, Chief. Uh, not in money, maybe, but I just uh, took you off the street beat and put you in a car. Now, that's a promotion. Yes, sir. You mean I get to keep this? <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, where are we? Uh, Stanton and Ninth. Hey, what kept you from picking me up? I, I wanted to get out to 22nd and J before the heavy morning traffic. You don't have to worry, Chief. Where we found the body is all cordoned off. A block each way. Detour signs and everything. Yeah, good thinking. I figured even though Brody got the pictures, you'd want to examine the place and check the moulages. Yeah, you figured right. Traffic ahead. I better hit the blower. And we'll make better time on Fremont. You 
were asking me what kept me. I, I was there when Mr. Spry, uh, Cornelius Spry, came into the morgue just about when I was telling the medical examiner about the ring and who you thought it was. So I figured I'd hang around to see what Spry said, you know? Yeah, I know. Uh, he identified Mrs. Scott. With tears in his eyes. When was the time of death, he asks. And the M.E. says around 10 o'clock last night. And Cornelius Spry asks, did the M.E. take in the fights last night? And then he says he was there at the arena, and he hopes he still has the stubs in his other suit to prove it. Interesting, huh? Hmm. That is. <laughs> Why would he think someone might ask him where he was? I figured maybe you were going to put him on the carpet. Well, that hadn't occurred to me, but maybe I will. I wouldn't want to disappoint him. Uh, right here. Uh, Jack! I got the chief here. You got those melanges of the tire tracks? Right here. Good morning, chief. Boy, as clean a pair of tracks as you could ever get. Went back and forth twice, like they wanted to make sure of something. Right, take a look at these, Kowalski. We sure ought to be able to find the car that made them. <laughs> At least since you came home for lunch, you can take smaller bites, Charles, and not bolt that egg salad sandwich that way. Am I uh, supposed to eat eggs? In moderation. One egg salad sandwich a week won't hurt you. But if you bolt it down, you'll get heartburn again. You know, you could have put a pickle and some potato chips on the side. There's no nourishment in those things. Eat slowly. Matilda, you knew Jesse, huh? What are you going to ask me? Now, what would she be doing at night? In pajamas and a robe, miles from her house, walking along J and 22nd. I mean, can you think of any reason why she'd be there? No, I can't. Does she have any history of amnesia or something? Did, did you ever hear any strange things like, like sleepwalking, for instance? No, I'd say of all the girls in our class, I think Jessie had her head screwed on the tightest. So she knew what she was doing. Matilda, you know, she was wearing a ring I gave her when we were in school together. Had it on her finger when she was run over. I'm sorry, Charles. No, I I'm truly sorry. The problem is, I don't believe it was an accident. But if it was murder, why? Money. Hmm? Money? No one really knows how much money she had, except maybe Ken Bradley at the bank. But I bet you there's not one person in town who doesn't believe Winfield Scott left her a packet. Mm, I hadn't thought of that. Well, think of it then. She was a wealthy woman. That's the way to go. A. Assume she was not the victim of a hit and run. And B. Whoever did it was after money. I could have told you that. Charles, Charles, where are you going? Back to the station house. <laughs> He's like a bulldog once he gets started on a case. It's hard to keep him sleeping and eating right, so I always try to help him without his knowing it. Ken Bradley, president of the National Bank's an old friend. Well, I called him to ask if Jesse Scott had drawn out any big sums recently or written any large checks. And if so, to whom? Ken would tell me on the QT. And then all I had to do was make Charles believe it was his idea to follow that lead. What makes this story different even in the annals of police work is the personal element. True, no matter who the victim was, the chief of detectives would have turned over every stone, every clue, run down every rumor, and interrogated every possible witness. But because it was Jesse Scott who had died, Charlie Allen wouldn't be able to eat, sleep, or rest until he knew who was guilty. I shall return shortly with Act Two. In the law versus the lawless, the division is sharp. The hunter versus the hunted. As our curtain rises on Act Two, we have met the hunter, Chief of Detectives Charlie Allen. Who he hunts will depend upon what he finds and how he interprets his findings. Within 18 hours of the reported crime, Charlie and Officer Kowalski stand in front of a certain house on a tree-lined street in the better part of town. Is it this where she lived, Chief? Uh, 
I used to park right where you stand, the Kowalski. I'd go and ring the doorbell of her house, drop in, have a cup of coffee. We'd talk about the old days. <laughs> Sometimes I'd pull right up into this driveway. Yeah, let's get the garage door shut. Sure. I got the light. Hey, the place is empty. Yeah, well, Jessie uh, didn't own a car. She didn't drive. Somebody did. Well, tire cracks. Uh, Kowalski, you got those tire moulages with you? Yeah, they're in the radio car. Uh, get them, will you? What are you thinking? Just a little feeling I got in my Sherlock bones. Why do you suspect? Suspect? All I do is observe. What are tire tracks doing in Jesse's garage? Go on, Kowalski. Get the moulages and bring them here. Be right back, Chief. They don't look so different, do they? See that little bulge made by the right front tire? Looks a lot like what we've got from 22nd and J. They're identical, Chief. What do you think it means? Murder. First degree murder. How do you figure that? Someone brought a car into this garage and got Jesse into it, alive or dead. But she was particular about keeping the garage locked. So it must have been someone she knew who asked her to have it open that night. They pull out, find a dark stretch on J and 22nd. Yeah, none of the street lights was working. Perfect place to dump her out and maybe run her over to make it look like a hit and run. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Kowalski? I want you to run a rope around the garage and the house. And I want two ships on guard. Nobody is allowed in. Yes, Chief. Get Murdoch on the blower. Tell him to bring his equipment over here. I want a complete dusting of the garage for anything that shouldn't be here. Fingerprints, strands of hair, match, uh, the cigarette. Uh, tell him Jesse didn't smoke. He'll know what to do. And if we haven't been stupid enough to smudge the fingerprints on the overhead door handle... Who knows? Then, when he's through in here, the same routine in the house. You think she was murdered here? Yeah, we'll find out. Right up. Okay, I'll get him. Shall I use the car radio? Uh, no, there's a phone over there on the wall. Pick it up with your handkerchief. Hey, hey it rang. That's spooky, ain't it? Someone dialed Jesse and the garage extensions on the same line. You gonna pick it up? I, I, give me your handkerchief. Hello? Charles, it's me, Matilda. I knew it could only be you, honey. How did you know? You know how my mind works. Did you find anything in Jesse's house? No, we're not in there. Kowalski and I are in the garage. Uh, what'd you call me for? Well, I didn't think you could wait. I just heard from Ken Bradley at the National Bank. Now, you sure you didn't call him? And he said, had I heard from Jesse lately, and I said... Didn't he know that she was in an accident? Matilda, what's this all about? Well, nothing, except Jessie has her account in the same bank as we do. Maybe Ken knows something, that's all. I thought maybe since he's an old friend, you'd want to see him. Gotcha. Matilda, that's good thinking. Will you be home for dinner? Uh, I'll let you know. Hey, thanks for the call. Bye. Uh, that's a wife of mine, Kowalski. Says a banker we know just happened to call her the bank where Jesse Scott kept her money. Money? Maybe a motive, huh? You bet your shield. <laughs> yeah, Matilda, she sure makes me laugh. What's a joke? It's not the first time. She hound dogs these clues, see? Then hands me just enough. I don't think I get that. That's a uh, little involved. What it comes down to is when a cop becomes a detective like me and he gets married, before he knows it, he doesn't have a wife. He's married to another detective. Ken, I'm glad you could see me. I talked to your wife, Charlie, and she said you'd be coming over because, Jesse, well, it doesn't look like an accident. I don't think it was, Ken. I'm giving out a story to the papers today. Jesse set great store by your advice, if I remember. Uh, not only financial, am I right? Uh, if she did, she never showed it. I remember trying to advise her on long-term securities. But now, she had to listen to him. Cornelius? Uh, swallowed his line, hook and sinker. Dying like that in the street. Incomprehensible. Exactly our feelings, Ken. 
That's where we're taking a very close look. Yes, he was such a lovely person. Generous, helpful. I can tell you now. Someone didn't unknowingly run her down. It was planned and premeditated. <sighs> but who and why? I don't yet know who. But the why could be money. And that's why I wanted to see you, Ken. So the advice on investments Jesse listened to came from Cornelius, acting as her attorney. Well, not only that, since presumably he had Jesse's best interests at heart, she gave him, in some misguided moment, power of attorney. Oh, I didn't know that. Nobody did. Cornelius dropped a lot of her money she'd inherited from Winfield into mining stock, gold stock, oil exploration, all whiskey investments. While still a mistake is a mistake. If it was. A lot of her funds, in fact everything that wasn't nailed down in an irrevocable trust, just plain disappeared. Vanished. Her money vanished? How much? Well, into six figures. And if I did nothing else for Jesse, at least I alerted her to that fact. It was right here, Charlie, in this office, not two weeks ago. She sat where you're sitting, and Cornelia sat to her right. I can still hear him saying, Jesse, Jesse, don't you trust me? Six figures. Well, that could be 200,000. More than twice that. So, in effect... There was a shortage of about half a million of Jesse's money. Ken? Thanks. You've given me something I didn't have before. Have I? Well, what is it, Charlie? A motive for a murder. Well, come in, Kowalski. What's the story? I don't know how much of this is useful... I don't think Cornelius Spry is doing as well as he likes to make out, money-wise. You know, he's got a chauffeur who drives him around. Andy Moran. Yeah, I know all about him. Moran served two years for robbery, and Cornelius Spry got him out with a personal pitch to the parole board. He works for him now. That's right. Anyway, Andy lives near where I do, he and his wife, June. We go to the same bar in Littleton. Well... He and I got to drinking, and maybe he said more than he wanted to. He said that until a few days ago, he hadn't been getting paid. Well, what happened a few days ago? Suddenly, his boss paid up everything he owes him. Uh-huh. Uh, what kind of car does he chauffeur? I told her that right away. Struck a wall. That's what I meant when I said I don't know how useful this will be. I thought, who knows, maybe I'll go around to Spry's garage and check the tires, right? Mm Mm-hmm. He's got no car. It's been in the shop for three weeks now. Mm, That's what Moran told you. Yeah, yeah. So he says, I guess I really can't complain, seeing as how I haven't been doing much chauffeuring for him. uh, Try to remember, Kowalski. Did Andy Moran say he hadn't been doing much or hadn't been doing any driving? I'm not sure. Bring him in. I think you've got something. He said he might go fishing one of these days. Didn't say where. But you're going to find out where, like all good detectives, aren't you, Kowalski? Charlie, the press boys have asked me to get your statement on the Jesse Scott hit and run. The police department has come to the conclusion that Mrs. Winfield Scott did not suffer death at the corner of J and 22nd as a result of a hit and run accident as earlier reported. Am I going too fast for you, Mary? Nope. We now have definite proof Mrs. Scott died as the result of premeditated murder at the hands of... Mm-hmm. Person or persons unknown got that. No, you haven't. We have reason to believe that Mrs. Scott's attorney, Cornelius Spry, is implicated. Cornelius Spry, the former public defender? Yep, the one and the same. Have you a confession? No, but we're bringing him in. Naturally, we would prefer that Mr. Spry came into headquarters of his own volition, and we hope he'll do just that. That's the end of the statement, Mary. Uh, This office will be getting back to you, hopefully in 24 hours, with more details. Do you really think you'll have it cracked by then? I think so. 
Charlie. I was just called by the Examiner Journal and by the Times Trib and two other papers, all of whom wanted to know what I had to say about Chief of Detectives' accusation that I was implicated in Jesse's death. How dare you give out such a statement? There's not a word of truth in it. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Cornelius, but the facts indicate otherwise. What facts? You, you end those, yes, well, maybe, but what facts? At this point, Cornelius, I can only divulge them to the district attorney. If it all proves untrue, I can only say, I'm sorry. Ah, what does your sorrow mean to me? Uh, once the story is in print... The damage is done. I'll be glad to apologize. Retractions mean nothing. I'll see you in court. Oh, yes, you will. But before I go, I might inform you that everything you were told by Ken Bradley at the bank is without foundation. If you think it was to my advantage to have my best client dead because I stood to gain money or was in debt or made injudicious investment decisions on behalf of my client... You'll have a hard time proving it. We'll see. Charlie, you must know by now you can't build a case on hearsay or indirect collateral or secondary information. Only a prima facie case will stand up in court. Everything else is calumny. And believe me, I'll sue the police department up and down until you and it will be completely discredited, my friend. Goodbye. Officer Kowalski, you've been listening to this outside this door? Just stayed in here, sir. You think he means it? I mean about suing the police? Uh, I can't read his mind. But I've accomplished exactly what I set out to do. Put that man on the defensive. I don't see how. He's attacking. He's threatening a lawsuit. Oh, sure, he can say that. After all, <laughs> getting himself a lawyer doesn't cost him anything. I think you'll agree that if Cornelius Spry had some hand in this crime, he is certainly an excellent actor. But whoever is guilty of the murder of the wealthy widow, Jessie Scott... They will discover that our friend Charlie will pursue the guilty one until the law avenges the untimely death of his old sweetheart. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Conan Doyle, master mystery storyteller, once said, Detection is, or ought to be, an exact science and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. Tinge it with romanticism, and you produce the same effect as if you worked a love story into the fifth proposition of Euclid, unquote. Whether Chief of Detective Allen's love for the deceased Jesse Scott will help or hinder him, we shall soon discover. Chief, he's gone. I went to pick Andy up, and he's gone. Fishing? Nope, just gone. Nobody knows where he went. So, Andy Moran didn't go fishing. No, sir. The bartender told me he saw him two nights ago, but when I went around to where he lives, no answer. Then I went over and rang the service bell at Cornelia Spry's place. And a new man comes out and says, he's the chauffeur. Where's Andy Moran, I ask? He don't know any Andy Moran. That is good news. What? All good news. How can you say that? Kowalski, send out an all-points bulletin. Moran did time, so mugshots must be on file. Our former public defender got the wind up, went home and told Andy to run for the hills. So now we can assume they're both in on it. If we knew what they were in on, mm, we'll find out. Put out the APB. <laughs> What are you doing, Hope? What, what are you doing to those drawers I fixed so carefully? Hey, Matilda, I'm uh, looking for a clean pair of socks. Socks are in the top drawer where they've been for 20 years. Yeah. Where are you sleeping these days? You never come home. Oh, Matilda, don't bug me. Oh, that's a good sign. When you're short with me, that means that pieces are falling into place. Ooh, I'm a long way from that. 
What have you got? No witnesses, a motive I'm not that sure about. You mean Cornelius not wanting to give Jesse an accounting of money he probably stole from her? Oh, you've been talking to Ken Bradley at the bank again. Well, he's as anxious to get to the bottom of this as you are. Anything else? Yeah, murder. I brought his boys over to Jesse's garage. They found gray hairs. Hers? Yeah, they're in the lab, but probably. Charles, while you're changing your socks, I, I, I want to tell you what I've been up to. Uh, honey, I, I'd love to hear it, but uh, some other time. Oh, where are you going? I, I thought you wanted clean socks. I, I suddenly realized Kowalski may not know the drill. I, I told him to set out an APB for Andy Moran, and I, I want it in the works before that joker decides to leave the country. You do mean Andy Moran, the ex-con who chauffeurs for Cornelius? Yeah, that's who I mean, yeah. The same Andy Moran who married my sister? Yeah. He's the man, yes. He had something to do with it? Now, honey, so long. Uh, don't wait up for me, huh? It, it's Andy Moran. I want to talk to you about... I saw June in the supermarket. Being married to a detective who needs all the help he can get but won't accept it from his wife makes me so mad sometimes I could scream. But I don't scream. I hold it in. He's got his Sherlock bones, and I've got my hunches. Take today. I'd just seen my sister, June Moran, in the supermarket. I couldn't get to talk to her before she had left, and I saw her get on a bus. It was a Galesville bus, which meant she was in Galesville visiting her in-laws, Andy's folks. I knew they were looking for him, so I thought I'd help. Long time no see, Andy. Well, you know how it is. What did you want to see June about? Oh, not a whole lot, really. I happened to see her in the supermarket, and it's been too long. She's the only sister I've got. How are you? Marty, you don't fool me. You don't go chasing all the way out here to where my folks live just to cozy it with June. All right, Andy. I'll be frank. You know, Charles has always been more than fair. And when Cornelius Spry spoke up for you at the parole board and offered you a job, no one was more delighted than Charles was. He knew what a difference it had made to June. What's up? Oh, I'd rather talk it over with June. Uh, look, Maddie, if I were you, I'd go downstairs and take the bus back to town and don't worry about your sister. I'm taking good care of her. Real good. Andy, you haven't gotten into trouble again, have you? It's none of your business. I'd hoped you'd gone straight. Does Cornelius know what you've been up to? Everything is all right. I uh, just remembered I have to take a pill. Where are you going? Just to the bathroom. Andy, if something's wrong, why don't you just come clean? At least for June's sake. Why don't you stop interfering, Maddie? I wish you hadn't come here. I really do. Andy, I can't talk to you if you keep dodging behind my back. What is it with you? Of course I have to come here. Charles is sending out an APB for you. I... Andy! 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 Sorry to do this to your sister-in-law, but I need the time to get away. She'll be awake in a couple of hours. Police headquarters, Inspector Allen speaking. Inspector, this is Kowalski. I located a car that made those tracks. It belongs to Lieutenant Norris of the 4th Precinct. What? A, a, a police lieutenant? Right, right. His car made those tire tracks. He told me he loaned the car to Annie Moran, who needed a car, because Mr. Surprise was in the shop. Remember I told you? Uh, wh uh, where's the car now? Lieutenant's got it back. Will you get Murdoch over there fast to give the car his microscopic eye? And, and tell him to call me when he's finished. Yes, sir. But, Matilda, what, what are you doing here? You look awful. Uh, can I sit down, oh. Charles? Yeah, here, uh, Thanks. lay feet on me. Boy, what have you done to yourself? Huh? Your hair's all down, your clothes, your... What happened? 
Hey, you weren't mugged, were you? No, I, I found Andy Moran, and uh, he chloroformed me. I only just got away. I mean, uh, I mean, it was hours ago. I knew you'd be here all night. Charles, I, I was only trying to help. No, 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 no. Take, take it easy, one thing at a time. Now, just tell me what happened. And then when I woke up, Andy was gone. Matilda, I don't know what to tell you. Darling, you could have been... Well, I was only trying to help. Andy could have killed you. Oh, he wouldn't do anything like that. Who knows what he'd do? Anyone who keeps chloroform handy would do anything. I'll send for someone to drive you home. Uh, uh, just a sec. Yes? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Moran here to see you, sir. Uh, has he been frisked? Oh, yeah. He's clean. Okay, uh, bring him upstairs. Uh, leave her down at the desk. Well, your sister and her husband are here. I'm having him sent in. Now, you can go down and stay with June if you want, or I'll get you home. They're here? I bet she talked him into it. Uh, I'll stay with June. Andy! I'm sorry, Maddie. It was dumb of me. Here, your handbag. You left it. Inside, Andy. Stand over there. Andy, you are in deep trouble. I see a count of murder one. I see another of aggravated assault. Charlie, I didn't mean to hurt Maddie. I just had to get out of there. And I didn't kill no one. I know it looks bad. It doesn't look bad. It is bad. How come you're here to give yourself up? June talked me into it. Did you know there's an all points out for you? No. But I knew you'd be after me. Cornelius told me. Oh. Did he? What did he say to you? Well, he said, the heat's on, you better get out of town. He gave me 500 bucks and told me to go as far as I can. Then what did you do? I went out to Galesville to my folks. Persuaded them to take a trip and then... Tried to figure out where we'd go. It wasn't easy because June was after me to tell her what was up. Then Matilda showed up. And the only way I could see to get away was to give her something to sleep. I met June and hustled her out to the bus depot. And she wouldn't get on a bus until I told her the whole story of how Cornelius Spry had killed Jesse Scott... Because he was in such deep water over money he'd taken. But I had nothing to do with the killing. Charlie, I swear it. I just borrowed a car and drove it to where he told me. And then I beat it. But Andy, didn't you know a murder had been committed? Uh, I... I read about it the next day. Well, why didn't you come to see me then? He swore if I said one word... He'd make sure I'd be in the clink forever. My word against his. The next con against the next public defender. What chance would I have? None at all. Unless you change your mind and get on the right side of the law. Well, by doing what? Do you know where Cornelius is? I got a real good idea. Well, then you get real good and persuasive and hustle him down to headquarters at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. I don't care what you tell him, but you get him here. So when it comes to plea bargaining for you, Andy, I might just be in a position to help you. Cornelius showed up at 8. Said he'd been away on business, but he admitted nothing. I wanted to help Charlie. I watched him work getting confessions, and I knew one way was to scare the living daylights out of a suspect. So I put on the bathrobe Jesse was murdered in and waited for the right moment to play the ghost of Jesse. Poor Charlie. He was really batting zero. You didn't ask Andy to find you a car? I did not. You didn't instruct him to drive it to Jesse's garage the night she was murdered? I did not. I was nowhere near there. You didn't go to Jesse's house that evening and strangle her? I 
did not. And then bring her body down to the car in the garage? No, I did not. Then sir. drive the body to the corner of 22nd and J, dump it, and make it appear she'd been hit by an unknown driver? I was at the arena that night. You say. You have not delivered one witness who saw you there. Charlie, I know that Jesse is missing and has been for over two weeks. I admit I did go to the morgue and identify a woman I thought looked like Jesse, but... I was wrong. It wasn't her. I suggest to you that Jesse is somewhere alive. Perhaps she's lost her memory. And the ring I gave her on her finger? Perhaps stolen. Perhaps found by someone. Uh, now, would you turn this light out that's facing me? I, it's really blinding. I'm sitting here and I can't see you, really. I just know it's your voice across the table. We keep the room dark. Oh. With the light on you so we can watch your face. What? Who? Who's that coming? Who is he? Hello, Cornelius. Charlie. Charlie, she's... she's here. I trusted you, Cornelius. Why did you have to do it? Ah... Uh. I... I don't feel well. What's the matter with you, Cornelius? What is it? Where, where's the door? You can't see the door. You will never run away from me, Cornelius. I'll always be there. Hey, get, get her out of here. Get her away from me. I... All right. I, I did it. I did it. Yes, I did it. Charlie, Charlie, please save me. Don't you see her? It's... Jesse. Huh. He's fainted. Matilda, I gotta hand it to you. What did I tell you? He's the one man I thought would never believe in ghosts. Kowalski, come on in and pick up the accused. I think he'll give us a confession when he comes to... Charlie is taking my help a little more seriously these days. Of course, my coming in wearing one of Jesse's dresses and an identical gray wig could only have worked because Charles had pretty much worn him down. And you know what? They're making me an honorary member of the force. So you better watch your step. Officer Matilda may be assigned to your case. For the record, the following day, Cornelius Spry admitted the murder, was tried and sentenced, and is still serving a life term. He is given wide berth by fellow inmates in the pen because he apparently sees his victim at odd times, generally in the exercise yard. Then he runs to a guard and begs to be locked into his cell where no ghost of the past can reach him. I shall return shortly. Doc, the world's first great detective has said, those who believe they can commit a crime so perfect it will not be discovered must first of all reckon with the accuser, judge and jury within themselves, their conscience, for sooner or later conscience will arrest the criminal. There are very few perfect crimes because man himself is imperfect. Our cast included Russell Horton, Carol Titel, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by White Westinghouse Appliance Company. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, peace and peace.